It is a very great pleasure and honor for me to introduce Dr. Alyosha Smolic, short jo Josh. Uh, Josh studied at the Technical University of Berlin and uh, got his PhD at the Technical University of Aachen, RWTH, where he always, also got a, an award for his PhD of high reputation. And after that, they worked for a while for the Fraunhofer Institute, for the Heinrich Hertz Institute, Hertz Institute in, at Fraunhofer, where he was already dealing with a lot of uh, stuff on uh, advanced video coding. He is also well known for the MPEG guys because he chaired uh, uh, an actor group uh, for advanced 3D video coding and also he had very uh, basic contributions for the multi-view codi coding. And since two, uh, 2009, uh, he is at Walt Disney Research in Zurich, where he's responsible for almost everything that's interesting and fancy, 2D, 3D videos, advanced videos, and I'm sure that he will give us a very interesting uh, talk, and I'm very glad for listening to it. Yes, thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction and uh, also to the organizers for this uh, kind invitation to come here to this uh, workshop and to give this talk in this incredible auditorium with this super cool screen that I really uh, excited about. Um, and before I tell you about uh, 3D video processing, which is my main are area of research over the last years, let me tell you a bit about uh, who we are. So what, what is that? Disney Research. So IT companies, Microsoft and uh, Apple and those, they have research labs, but what the hell is a research lab of a entertainment industry? So if you think of Disney, this is what most people associate in the first place. So animated movies from Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck to Beauty and the Beast and Tangled, uh, as we see today. And uh, that's all true. That's what constitutes uh, Disney, but in fact it is much more. So Disney is the world's largest entertainment company and an umbrella under which you have a variety of very diverse business units which are all covered by the fact that they create content. So it's about content, it's about stories, about characters and about like entertainment. No? So there is still animated movies, feature animation is still there, but there's also Pixar. So another animated movie studio, there's also live action movies, Walt Disney Studios to Pirates of the Caribbean and these things. There's also Marvel now and we acquired Lucasfilm, so Star Wars is also a part of our company now. So that's all the movies, but there's also uh, television, so ESPN is part of the company, also ABC, so really major television broadcast networks. Then there's a whole business unit around parks, parks and resorts, Disneyland, Disney World, cruise ships, hotels, all of that, which is also very profitable. Then also things like consumer products, so all the toys and things that you buy in the Disney stores, interactive games, a lot of game studios. Now you see there's a lot of different things, but they are all bound together by the fact that it is about story, and there is also a lot of synergies by design. Uh, so if there is a new Pixar movie, there's also the theme park attraction a few years later, there are toys, there are games, there are t-shirts and all of that. And although the product is in the end a creative one, for making this product, the people use technology. And this connection between technology and creative art was also has tradition in the Disney company. So here you see a pattern from 1931 where Walt Disney himself is the inventor or one of the inventors. And it is about synchronizing movies with sound that didn't exist before. And he had this creative and business idea. So they invented the technology to make that actually happen. Another famous example, the so-called multiplane machine, where he had the idea, so let's do a first a new genre of movies, uh, animated movies for the cinema, 90 minutes uh, animated movie, which was not uh, possible up to that date because it was just not possible to draw that many images that, would, uh, uh, th that you would need for a 90 minutes movie. So they invented this multiplane machine which has like different layers of glass and you could paint different things on these layers. So for instance, the background would be painted only once. 
and all the moving characters would be on a separate layer. And then there is a camera that finally takes the picture through all of them. So, uh, and, and this made it possible to invent this first uh, animated movie that generated all other uh, things that we have before, no? so this multiplane machine. So the spirit of invention was uh, there from the beginning, and over the years it uh, disappeared a little bit, so Disney turned a little bit into a kind of old-fashioned um, uh, kind of enterprise, but it was revived in the last uh, decade by the acquisition of Pixar, maybe. So there were people like John Lasseter, the creative officer and mastermind director behind uh, the art in, tix in Pixar, and he created this sentence like, uh, art challenges technology and technology inspires art. So if they two go together, you can create something completely new. So they he paired up with uh, Ed Catmull, he was a co-founder of Pixar, and he is a, he's a scientist, he has a PhD in computer graphics, and he had major contributions to SIGGRAPH in the 70s. So really uh, a science guy and pairing up with a creative guy, they realized this vision of creating the first computer animated movie. And this is what made uh, the success of Pixar finally. Uh, and when Disney acquired Pixar, uh, also they took over a little bit the spirit of innovation, also uh, innovation in technology, and at some point, it was decided to also have research labs that would also do research not only for for like Pixar, like for the animation studios, but trying to connect to all these different business units uh, that you just saw. Uh, and so we founded Disney Research, and there are two labs currently. One is in Pittsburgh at Carnegie Mellon and one in Zurich. There will be a third one in Shanghai, which is currently being uh, established. And one of our topics, of course, there is the movies, there is the television, is uh, video technology, and that's why, uh, why I'm there. And so the one of the focuses over the last year was uh, something that I also did in, the, in my research before at Fraunhofer HHI in Berlin, is about uh, 3D. Um, so let's start with that. So 3D, let me first uh, introduce two terms. Uh, which I would call two different functionalities, and they are so both something that go beyond what we know from classical 2D video, so an array of pixels of moving images, but they both do not exclude each other. Uh, so 3D video and free viewpoint are two different functionalities. And the first one would be free viewpoint. Uh, so let me go directly to this. So it is something where you can freely navigate, you can freely choose your viewpoint and viewing direction onto the scene as you would know it from computer graphics, from games, from virtual worlds where you fly around. So the same functionality of free viewpoint, but not in the virtual world, but into something that was captured by a camera. No? So this object that you see here was captured by 16 cameras and reconstructed into a three-dimensional representation where you can now freely place your camera. So that's what we mean by free viewpoint. Um, another example, once you have this free viewpoint video object, you can integrate it into worlds and scenes and create such augmented sceneries which, with free viewpoint and computer graphics objects. And the functionality, as I say, is what I mean with free viewpoint. Um, and this is another example of the functionality. It's a reconstruction of a football match from just the two cameras that are available in the stadium and they reconstruct a full 3D model of the scenery. And once you have that, you can freely move your camera around and create virtual viewpoints onto the scenery that are not captured by the camera. And you can also recreate such graphics and overlay, annotate uh, the views, as you know, the three-dimensional structure of the scene. So that's what yeah, or here, for instance, you can put a camera to a position where it is more interesting to analyze uh, the game. Uh, so that's a product that is also used in broadcast today and which implements free viewpoint. Um, so then 3D, um, uh, if I talk about 3D, I mean something else, and this is the, if you look at the screen and get a three-dimensional perception, so you see depth structure of the scene. And this is something that actually is known already quite a while, so already in the uh, 19th century it was known 
um, that uh, if you project two different views into the user's eye, you will recreate a depth perception. And yeah, main it's many people believe that uh, nowadays the technology is mature enough and also the content creation is understood well enough that 3D, at least in some application areas and markets, is come to stay, now, which never happened in the years before. There were always ups and downs. 3D appeared and disappeared again, and this had um, yeah, reasons that technology and also content creation were not mature enough. But now we believe that at least for cinema and maybe a few other application areas, it is here to stay and that uh, it will be sustainable. So what happens? No? So this is the first 3D display that was already described in 1838. And it tries to, to fake the human visual system. Uh, so we create our perception of the 3D world to some part from the fact that we have two eyes and we have two different views onto the scenery. So we get two different images projected into our brain. And our, no our brain knows how to compute the depth perception out of what we call disparity. In between the two eyes. But this is only one of the cues that our brain uses. There's also motion parallax. So if something appears and disappears, you know that one thing is in front of the other. There are also a number of other cues that our brain uses really to create our wide range uh, depth perception. And yeah, one of the problems of 3D technology is that we are not able to recreate all of them in a natural way. Now, so here is the principle. So these are two mirrors, and if you go very close with your head to these mirrors, your left eye will see this image, and your right eye will see an image that is placed here. And if these two images are created very carefully, and that they would correspond to something that you would see from a certain viewpoint with your eyes, your brain will then create a 3D perception of the scenery. Uh, you, so you force your brain, it's really a brute force, of the human visual system. But you can also imagine that if these two images are not created carefully, if you have some kind of, if you took it with a camera that has some kind of vertical offset or it was rotated or if the color balancing was not right, um, you will create an unnatural impression and you will project something into the user's brain which doesn't make sense, where the brain has to fight against these conflicting cues that it gets from, from what, it, what it has. So the content creation of these images is something that has to be done very, very carefully in order to create a good stereoscopic content. Um, but even if you do it very carefully and everything is perfectly matched, so that's a, a science for itself, how to create good uh, stereoscopic 3D, how to capture it. Even then, if you display it, there is uh, a limitation such that if you look at the screen in 3D and something is floating outside of the screen, uh, if you are in a 3D theater, movie theater like that, and something is in front of the screen, your eyes will converge onto this position. Uh, so your virgin's cue, your rotation of the eyes will tell your brain this object is somewhere floating in front of the screen. But at the same time, the maximum sharpness, the accommodation will still be on the screen as the pixels are displayed there. So this is something which decouples two natural cues, the virgins and the accommodation, which in nature doesn't happen. And so if you verge on something in, in real nature, the sharpness and the virgins are in sync. And in a 3D cinema, they are always decoupled. Uh, so your brain constantly has to fight against these, these different cues. So this means also that this effect gets stronger the further something is away from the screen. So if something is getting very close at you, the accommodation convergence will be stronger than if you have the scenery close to the screen. Uh, so there might be something like a comfort zone around the screen, a certain volume that you shouldn't exceed in order not to overstress your audience. And this can be reflected into such rules of good stereoscopic uh, content creation. So that's from a, a, yeah, a textbook for uh, content creators. If you have the screen, you can divide it into the theater space and the screen space. And in order to create good stereoscopic content, you should respect a certain volume around the screen. But that doesn't mean that you cannot have a, a big moment where you have something floating out of the screen to create emotion, for instance, to create a wow 3D effect. But a good director will not exaggerate with that, but will keep, will carefully play with what we call the depth budget over a scene. Uh, so he will also use it as a means to transport 
the content of the story. So if there is no emotion, it will be maybe flat, and if there is an emotional scene, the, the volume will be expanded. But still you have to respect certain bounds in order uh, to not to overstress the audience. And if you, so you, you really should think of Stereo 3D as a volume around the scenery and you yourself somehow are related to this volume and the scenery. Um, and here are examples of what can happen. No? So if you would see this in 3D, you would have a certain depth distribution. So the girl would be pretty far out of the screen, already creating a little bit of uh, unpleasant feeling. And in the right example, there was, you see there is less parallax. No? The left and the right view are closer together, so this would appear closer to the screen. No? Um, so I will tell you later that here we did a kind of correction. So we took the left image and we did a, s a disparity mapping, so we changed the depth perception in a certain way which you can formalize also by operations on disparity. No? So your input image has a certain disparity distribution, and now you define, for instance, a linear mapping that would change the depth volume. Or you can also define non-linear mappings that would treat different areas in your depth volume differently. For instance, if you have a an object that is in front of the screen, you want to push it back, but you don't want to flatten it out, then you would apply such a nonlinear operation. No, but for the moment, you can think of operations that are changing the disparity, the depth perception on the screen as such disparity mapping operations. And here are a few examples. So here you see the head of the cow would be coming out of the screen and the background would, be would go into the screen. And here's a manipulation where we push the head of the cow back onto the screen, so it doesn't have any parallax, so the nose tip is just on the screen here. And in this example, so this is a nonlinear operation as we didn't change the background, nonlinear in depth, and this is a, uh, a linear depth upscale. No? So the cat is coming more out of the screen in the right example, and also the background is going more into the screen. So as an illustration of what we mean with disparity mapping. And we will see later examples of that. And also, by the way, all of this material, or many of this material, is online available. So you can uh, download it and watch it on your 3D uh, display at home in your lab. So now let's uh, look at uh, what is actually the processing chain that we uh, consider here. So we have the 3D world that is captured by some camera systems and in the end we want to reinstantiate pixels, rays back uh, into the world. And so the first step is acquisition, camera systems. Typically, this is a typical stereoscopic camera system. There are multi-view camera systems uh, or one high quality camera and satellite cameras, there are depth sensors, Kinects are used. So all of this goes together into this module of acquisition for uh, 3D. Then all of these modules are huge research areas uh, for itself. No? Once you have acquired these data, you will do some processing, some conversion into other types of data, for instance, recreating a 3D mesh out of them, a 3D structure, we saw an example of that or some kind of depth estimation to create some video plus depth representation. So this is a step of error-prone computer vision image processing algorithms that try to take the signals and convert them into some other types of data, which are defined actually by a certain 3D scene representation. Uh, so if all these algorithms that we will look at now are dependent on some kind of representation of the 3D world. And this can can be, for instance, 3D meshes or other types of things that we will see. So at this point, you have uh, data in a certain format. And then the next step is to encode those, no? so to remove all redundancies and irrelevancies and to get uh, nicely compressed bit streams out of that. So here we have things like multi-view video coding that would compress the bits for transmission or here illustrated dynamic mesh coding plus video textures to encode such three-dimensional video objects that are moving in time and space. So that's coding. At this point, we have bits. And then you pack those bits into something to transmit them. So you store them on some device or uh, use uh, some kind of broadcast or transmission system. So uh, that's maybe what I know least about, but you maybe most. Uh, and then 
after decoding, you again have these data, but in order to display, you have to recreate images, and that's what we call rendering. So you take your data and recreate certain images that your display uh, requires. And finally, you have some kind of a three-dimensional display that reprojects these rays back uh, into, the, into the user's eyes. No? And then you have this, uh, your stereo 3D impression. Um, so, another thing to characterize or to, yeah, to characterize things is to think of these 3D scene representations. And if you survey 3D and uh, free viewpoint literature, you will see that it's very similar to computer graphics, there is a continuum of possible representations in between two extremes. No? On the one hand, you have this what we call purely image-based representations, where you have a dense sampling of your scene. You have many cameras that capture a lot of rays of a scenery from different viewpoints. So that's purely image-based. On the other hand, you have meshes. No? So you have the complete understanding of all the, the 3D surfaces with appearances and textures of your scenery, so the full model-based representation. And in between, there is a continuum of different representations that make use more or less of elements of both worlds, like video plus depth maps, or multiple videos plus multiple depth maps, and uh, other things like that. So that's something that, on the one hand, determines your extraction algorithms as, as they have to generate this data, and on the other hand, also determines your rendering algorithms and your capabilities of the free viewpoint navigation and also of the uh, of the perception. So the 3D scene representation is really a decisive thing for the design of such systems. Um, yeah, and at this abstract level, both counts for free viewpoint and 3D. So if you have pure view, free viewpoint, you just render a view. And if you have a 3D view, you render some uh, more views. But to say that this also in involves a, a variety of different data types. No? So on the one hand, you have multiple images, multiple view video. On the other hand, you have 3D mesh models, and in between you have 3D point samples, video fragments, layer depth video, multiple video plus depth, and these things. And now if you think back of the processing chain, you can draw a matrix uh, where we have here the representations, model-based, depth-based, image-based, and here you have the the processing chain, and you can come up with such uh, characterizations of these different systems uh, regarding uh, these different uh, criteria. So let's look at what people are... No, let's uh, first think of what are things that you would want to do with stereoscopic content um, when you capture it. So one thing is, as we said, uh, filming good stereo is, is a very difficult and challenging art and also very expensive. So you need expensive equipment and highly trained uh, uh, people to do that. So any technology that would assist crews on set to generate good stereo and to monitor it while capturing is something uh, that you want to have. The next thing is if you are in a post-production scenario, in a movie production or so, you you want to correct errors that happened during the shooting, now if you have too much depth or things like that. But you also want to have artistic control such that um, the artist can later decide about the depth composition, increase or decrease certain volume of elements. And then the next step is once you have created your uh, stereoscopic product, it still will only look like that in a certain viewing environment. No? So if you look at the stereoscopic display and you move around, you will see that the scene will move around. If you go to it and go back from it, it will change uh, the, um, the appearance. So it's pretty much like with stereo audio, where you have the right um, perception only in one place in the room. The same holds also for a 3D cinema. So if you are in a cinema, if you get closer to it, things get more shallow. If you go further away, things get more volume. And the cube is actually only a cube at one certain point in a cinema. So if you go to watch a movie, never go too close to the screen. That can really be painful. And don't go too much to the sides, as you also get shearing. So try to get those seats uh, in the middle. But also, if you want to retarget your content to different uh, display types, you have to change the disparity as the viewing conditions on such a device are 
very much different than on a on a on a cinema and something will not look the same if you don't change the disparity on your handheld or TV at home so also for porting things to other viewing conditions there is some kind of change of the depth uh, required um, and another thing we have so upcoming hopefully soon will also be displays that do not require glasses so-called multi-view autostereoscopic displays and that's also something where we uh, uh, look a lot at in our lab so these displays um, allow you to perceive stereo 3d without glasses but you have to display a number of views onto them now so 8 9 16 or more views are typically used on these autostereoscopic screens so one additional functionality for this is if you have captured only two views how do you generate this multitude of different views to be uh, displayed on such a display so if we summarize that, uh, these systems require rendering a continuum of output views. No? So you want somehow to change your camera position, your virtual position towards the scene after the content was captured. So you can think of such a spatio-temporal video continuum no? where you have a number of cameras that captured the scene and you want to virtually put your camera somewhere else as that would change your depth perception or you want to do stereo to multi-view conversion then you have to create more of these views um, and one or the the state-of-the-art approach to achieve that is to to do depth image based rendering uh, so assume if you have so the the idea is you have one certain camera view and you want to create a virtual view that is somewhere close to your original camera that captured the scenery. And so if you have an original camera and have the position and the direction of the cameras that captured these rays, and you have yeah, you want you have a depth map that tells you for each of the pixels where it was in the 3D scene, then you can project each of the pixels into the 3D world and project it back onto a virtual camera. So a video and a depth map will give you this functionality of placing a virtual camera somewhere off the one that you that captured the scenery. But you see that in this image already that there are limitations to that. No? So for instance, if if you move your camera around, you you virtually look around objects. So the content that was hidden behind a foreground object in this scene is not recreatable in this virtual view so you will have holes where you don't where you have foreground objects occluding background and another problem yeah so this is shown here if you move your camera to the left uh, if this is your original pair now uh, you want to look behind the dancer in this scenery this creates this hole or if you move your camera to the right you want to look here behind the dancer this creates the holes on the other side so forward mapping uh, gives you these limitations and also if you do the simple forward mapping you will not always hit a pixel if you project something back and forth so we'll have these this type of cracks but that's a, a minor problem actually so the approach then is to take more than one view so you have two views with two depth maps and then you can actually with uh, with a good reliability fill all the holes for the in-between views so you can do a good view interpolation from such uh, having two views and if you think it further if you have more views if you have multiple views with multiple depth maps now if you have eight then this data set you see how if you look at the calendar and the dancer you see that that's a multi-view set captured by eight cameras each like taken with 20 centimeters distance to each other and then they somehow computed these depth maps that will tell you for each of them where the the scenery is in the 3d space and uh, then we will see if you for the application of supporting auto stereoscopic displays now you have a number of output views that you want to to show on that display and you have a l another number of input views with depth maps now you can regenerate these in between views by this process of depth image based rendering that would put you the virtual cameras v2 v3 v4 that are rendered somewhere in between V1 and uh, V5. Um, and this is an example. No? So that's um, a virtual camera move along this axis of the eight cameras. So eight of these views are uh, original camera views and all the other views are 
interpolated in between of them. And you will also see if you look at areas like here in between the legs or around object borders, there are halos, there are color differences, or here at his back there are problems that happen. Now, at, at certain points you will see artifacts that uh, result from this type of processing. And the reason for these artifacts is that the depth estimation is an unresolved and error-prone uh, yeah, algorithm yet that will still not provide you depth maps that would uh, yeah, guarantee that you won't get such artifacts. And here is now a free viewpoint video. Now, so we are virtually moving around this uh, continuum while we can also freeze the camera and move around. Now, and now I'm exploring the spatiotemporal video continuum and can create all of these, uh, these effects. Um, another example of free viewpoint. Now the scene is again freezed and we are flying around. And for instance, you see if you look at that, there are things that happen especially around object borders. And object borders is something where depth estimation fails uh, typically. And on the other hand, they are also that which is pretty much important for, for our perception. So that's really a problem in, the, in this approach. But you can do something. Uh, uh, here are again a few of these examples that result from inaccuracies in depth estimation. But as we, if you have depth maps, you can also, yeah, and you know that you will have problems there, you can also do something. So you can do edge detection on your depth maps. This will give you depth discontinuities, and you can then treat these edges differently than the kind of reliable areas that are inside the object. Yeah, so here is an iterative process that first that treats these regions differently. So it all first projects everything that is in reliable areas, so you get this. Then it projects, it fills the remaining parts from the unreliable areas, and finally it does a filtering uh, over the object borders to get such a smooth, smoothed out uh, result uh, for the final rendering. And so these types of specific border edge treatment will allow you to mitigate some of these errors that happen in, in the depth maps. Uh, so here, for instance, these halo effects can be nicely um, corrected. Now, so this is an example of such a, a more advanced view interpolation algorithm that would take a pair of video plus depth and treat things layers separately and using edge estimation and so to get to a smooth, nice uh, rendered view. And here are a few more examples. So this is a virtual move from an original camera to yeah to another one. Now you see the edges look nicer now, but still there are still there are uh, artifacts in this. Now also another problem is different color matching in between the colors. If you if both cameras are not calibrated in color very well, if you paste the pixels from them together, you will see that to some extent. As uh, if you look at here. And this is uh, a virtual view synthesis in between, just in the middle of between of the original cameras, so 10 centimeters away from, from the original cameras. And you see you can generate nicely looking intermediate views, but still, if you look at that, uh, still there are artifacts in that, that uh, re come from the depth estimation. Also, if you look at his back, this is something where it specifically badly fails. Also, if you look in at his arms, there is also something where the whole filling from the two views doesn't work very, very well. So, as there are applications that strongly require such uh, uh, flexible data formats, uh, and there is technology that is able to to satisfy these requirements, MPEG started working on a, a standard that would provide such avan advanced 3D video functionalities. Um, and this will be available pretty soon, so a first extension of the MVC standard, uh, which adds depth maps to uh, to MVC will be available maybe uh, still this year. Um, and the basic idea about that is MVC, the so multi-view video coding is used on the 3D Blu-rays, for instance, and 
This would allow to add depth maps to 3D Blu-rays, and then you can buy Blu-rays with multi-view plus depth and have these virtual view functionalities uh, from the Blu-ray. But also the the HEVC, the new video coding standard, will have a 3D extension which will allow the transmission uh, of depth maps uh, with the video signals. Um, but the main challenges remain, so depth estimation is far from being resolved. It's not clear how these data will at all be generated, so there is the hope that content creation, so we, for instance, will provide depth maps with uh, with the content that may happen to some extent, but that wouldn't work for live broadcast or any other type of non-high-end film production, where it is really uh, unclear how to solve all these challenges on depth estimation, uh, to be accurate, robust, automatic, and real-time. So that uh, doesn't work so far. And also, the form factor of these acquisition systems for depth estimation, multi-cameras, are not something that is uh, currently like. Uh, acceptable in, in content creation. So there's still uh, challenges with that, but nevertheless, this will be available soon. So it is a, a data format that carries more than pixel data. It carries depth data, and it allows you not to do this adaptation of your view to have a depth remote control on your uh, or a depth button on your remote control that you can adjust your depth to your needs, or it, and it allows this rendering of a number of views for autostereoscopic displays. Now, so that's the idea again. So for the two view case, you have stereo and with the depth, you can virtually change your baseline and change your depth impression. Or if you have, or you can render any number of in-between views to uh, drive your autostereoscopic displays. But uh, as this uh, concept of depth estimation is still uh, unreliable. Uh, we were looking at other ways. Is there other ways that I can satisfy these uh, requirements uh, with a different technology? And we've, based on an, uh, some prior work we did at uh, ETH in Zurich on video retargeting, we've uh, found a new concept. So this is something where we look at aspect ratio retargeting of, of a video. No? So imagine you have this CinemaScope widescreen video and you want to put it onto a different aspect ratio. You want to uh, reduce the aspect ratio without cutting parts of the video away. So linear stretching would give you this, so it distorts linearly no? the whole content. And this is something that does this distortion in a content adaptive way. No? So it tries to identify what are the important regions like faces, no? and tries to preserve these areas while squeezing the unimportant areas more. So it's a nonlinear warping operation on the video that changes the aspect ratio in a in an content adaptive way. Um, and it actually works like that. So there are some image analysis parts that extract data and so th there are automatic parts, and it can also be like user-assisted that someone goes in and drives things. So what we need is basically saliency, so importance of image features, such saliency maps, and also motion and scene cuts, all of that goes into it. And then we find such a nonlinear warping function that would take your image, now you think of a piece of cloth with different stiffness, and now you squeeze and stretch it, and it would turn into a change of the aspect ratio by this, by this stiffness that you have. Right? And you get the different aspect ratio with yeah, the unimportant parts squeezed and the important parts uh, preserved. And that's actually something that's a big challenge in uh, today's media distribution in general and for a content creator, of course, uh, a nightmare. Now, if you have your content which is created in a certain aspect ratio and then uh, it is consumed on a variety of different devices with completely different aspect ratios and like cutting things out or putting black bars uh, is unpleasant and only works to some extent. No? So for instance, in a, some movies you have the main or the story of a shot is that you have a main character left and the main character right. Um, and they are in a dialogue scene and there is no way that you can cut out something from that and transport the artistic intent of such a scenery that the director had uh, by cutting something out. So that's why we thought of how can we do this conversion in a, in a different way. 
Um, yeah, and, and that's basically the algorithms. And here are some results. So one thing, also, Disney has this asset of uh, all the legacy content, which is in 4 to 3, a lot of that. Still, the old Disney movies are in 4 to 3. And when reselling them on Blu-rays, the people expect the whole screen to be filled. So we think of ways of yeah, upscaling uh, that. And here's an example. So that's linear scaling. And here you have the uh, content adaptive uh, retargeting. Now, for instance, this, that's Snow White linearly scaled. It's unexpectable. And here it's her appearance preserved. And instead, the, the background is, uh, is stretched more. No? So that's the process of upscaling. And also here, uh, specifically, if you look at characters, it's most noticeable, or at objects where you know the shape, like a, a clock should be round and not uh, stretched. And that's actually what the TV sets often do. Uh, so if you don't switch off your, uh, if you don't switch them to four to three. Also, the old uh, TV shows are basically in four to three, and like repurposing uh, would help them. Things, classics like MacGyver, uh, where there's always a watch in MacGyver that's like only a few seconds left, and and that's the the other way around, going from widescreen cinema resolution to 16 to 9. And yeah, here are a few examples how faces are are preserved better uh, in this process. Yeah, so that's now another tool that we have in our portfolio for these types of conversions between different uh, content formats. But the basic idea behind that is also that in order to change certain properties of the video, we are doing a content adaptive saliency driven squeezing and stretching. So the next thing that we came up with is uh, can we do that also with the depth, with the depth perception of the scenery? Um, so the basic challenge that we face that uh, typically this mapping of the of the real world, which is yeah infinite in its 3D dimensions, into this very limited space volume that you have on the screen, uh, this uh, this mapping, it's done by the people, the stereographer that on set choose a certain interaction distance of the cameras that would then do this mapping. No? And it's by no means uh, always the, the eye difference. No? So it depends really on the, on the distance of the objects to the camera and the volume that the director wants to have it on the screen. No? So if you capture a dialogue scenery, the distance will be much smaller, down to two centimeters maybe. And if you capture a landscape, you will go to 20 centimeters, maybe even to get the landscape really nicely represented in the volume. Uh, so that's also why these 3D cameras have these uh, mirrors where one camera is looking at the mirror and the other one is looking through the mirror as you can get them closer together as it would actually be possible with the, by the physical bodies uh, of the camera. But in these scenarios, once the, the the action is captured, it is baked into the video, and you cannot change the, the, the depth perception anymore. So unless you have depth maps and can do depth image-based rendering as uh, explained before. So we wanted to uh, face the same. Can we do the remapping after the thing was captured? And so here's again this example. Now on the left, you see again the, the, the happy Swiss cow. So the, sh the head of the cow is coming out of the screen, so it's inside the theater space, and the back of the cow, or the back here is uh, the landscape goes far into the screen. And here we did this manipulation, so we pushed only the cow back, or in fact only the head of the cow was pushed back while not changing the background, so it's a nonlinear change, uh, a nonlinear change in a, in a depth perception. Uh, so you can, that's where you notice the difference while not noticing the background. And if you think of the disparity histogram, uh, if this is the distribution of the disparity between left and right image, so you have things out of the screen and things inside the screen, we did such a nonlinear disparity mapping operation here. And this was achieved, again, not by this depth image-based projection, but simply in the image domain. So this is a process we call image domain warping. So we take both of the images and we apply a content 
adaptive warping to both of them, which would correspond to a change of the desired depth perception. Uh, so if you assume such a grid over the image and you move the grid only where the head of the cow is, a little bit to the right, and in the other a little bit to the left, you have the effect that the cow in the 3D space will go back. So by warping the images, you can implement your desired depth mapping. So yeah, here again the, the mapping. So to formalize this, we can think of uh, first such linear mapping functions. No? So assume you have captured something like that. You have three salient objects and you want to put them into the comfort zone. So you could, for instance, linearly squeeze the depth. A linear operation, no? a linear function would do this mapping. So that corresponds to a change of your interaction distance of the cameras. But what also happens in if you do it like that, you also flatten out the objects. No, so this operation gives you something like cardboarding. Um, but that might be the desired thing if you do, for instance, uh, display adaptation from cinema to, uh, to some other screen. Or uh, in a production scenario, you might want to do something different. Uh, for instance, you want to preserve the volume of the objects no, while squeezing this empty space in between them. So you define such a nonlinear mapping function that would be linear where you have your objects and it compresses the empty space. Yeah, so now you push everything together by not, by not changing the volume of the objects. And that's practically what we did with the cow. No? It was a nonlinear operation. Um, and how do we do that? No? So we have our in input video and we want to modify a certain aspect to implement this phi function. So we assume a pixel dense grid over the pixels and we are now looking for a deformation and this I can express as uh, the deformation of the grid uh, vertices of this grid so a nonlinear deformation that would exactly do this type of operation on two of the images so I'm looking for something f so I, the unknowns of my problem are these deformations the displacements of the grid variables and I can formulate that as a uh, energy minimization problem. Uh, so, uh, and for that, I have to uh, extract also data. So there's an image analysis step. But in contrast to DIBR methods, we do not try to estimate dense depth maps, but only sparse disparities at such points where I can get them with high reliability. So very distinct feature points. A number of those are estimated. And we also estimate saliency, so important image regions uh, should be preserved. So that's my image analysis that goes uh, in. And then I define these, so that's my disparities no, that tell me how, what the relation of, uh, of these objects to the screen is. And now I can define such, uh, I can say I want each of these disparities to change a certain ratio as defined by the phi function and formulate that as my disparity constraint. So it tells me for each of these sparse disparities that I have how much it should change. But still, still I don't want the, the image to, to distort these salient regions too much. So I give a counterweight, a smoothness term to this energy minimization that tells me do not deform the cells too much. No? So this means the change in X and Y shouldn't, should be limited. And this is multiplied by a saliency term. So the salient parts should be less deformed than the non-salient parts. No? And these, all of this goes into this energy minimization. And there are also temporal constraints that make sure that the warp doesn't change too much over time. All of that goes into the energy minimization and the result is a, a warp function that, would, that is the best compromise of all these conditions. So it, it's warping the images trying to satisfy the postulated phi function and also the saliency that, that we set. And here are the three nodes. So we don't need dense disparities, no depth maps, there's no, it, even no camera calibration. And as we only warp images, we also do not create holes and no impainting or things like that is necessary. So what happens is also illustrated here. If you look at the left is the input and the right is the output. No, so we didn't change the grid inside the salient object. We squeezed the background here and we stretched it there and 
yeah, virtually moved this object to the right. Um, and you can do that also, here it is, a virtual camera move. So in the middle is the original image, and now we are virtually moving the camera around, around this, uh, this position. And you see, I cannot go, I cannot do very strong rotations, do free viewpoint video with that, as at some point you would want to see disocclusions and occlusions. So the squeezing and stretching would only allow you a very limited range of virtual camera positions around your, uh, your initial position. But at in this area, which is kind of uh, for the stereo case, uh, we found some uh, subjective tests that it works very well within this, uh, this limit. Now, so now if you do it with both of the images, uh, you are virtually moving your cameras and you are virtually, by image domain warping, moving your, uh, virtually moving your uh, interactual distance. And then you can also do it only partially. So, so here you see only the only this part of the scene moves and not the background. So here it is a non-linear mapping. It only changes the depth perception of of these spectators here in the foreground. And in this example, we had like these people were like too far out of the screen, creating unpleasant depth. So we we can push them back into the screen and correct for that by this non-linear uh, view synthesis. Oh, I'm running pretty late. So this now opens uh, a variety of applications, pretty much the same as uh, you would see in DIBR. So we can do display adaptation. We can automatically correct things. So this could be, be running inside the camera system, making sure that you always have good stereo as output. You can do that in post-production, but you can also give the artists completely new ways to, to create their content. Um, yeah, this is an example of linear uh, operators for the display adaptation. So this would even allow you to have a button on your remote control that adjusts you the depth um, uh, as you do like uh, color or brightness today. And here we used it for correcting a so-called framing problem. No? So this car is coming out of the screen. No? So it's inside the theater space, but at the same time it is occluded by the borders. And that's what we call a stereoscopic window violation. No? So something which is in front of the window cannot be covered by the window. So perceptually looking at this is very unpleasant. So your brain cannot resolve this ambiguity. So one solution would be to detect that there is a window violation and then push the car back into the screen and resolve. No? So here you see the car is not coming out of the screen and it's much more pleasant to look at that. But it's still not changing the disparity in the background. So that's a nonlinear change. And yeah, the, the last thing I want to show is you can use the same algorithms also to stereo uh, to multi-view conversion as we saw with DIBR before. Um, yeah, and that's actually something which is from the application perspective uh, very important. So the current production is stereo, and this will remain like that for uh, the next X years. So people are not going to use multi-view uh, setups for, for capturing. Um, so capturing many more views is impractical for many reasons. And maybe the most important thing is that you don't know how many views your display would need. So there are different manufacturers. There are th these numbers, 8, 9, 16, 28. And in order to support all of them, you have to have a format that decouples the capturing from the display. Uh, so you cannot capture exactly what you have. Um, so for that reason, you will need algorithms that would take stereo as input. So the existing Blu-rays, the existing stereo 3D TV channels, all of that has to work with the displays. So you have to do uh, view synthesis. And one thing that you could do is to do this view synthesis at the receiver, so to have a chip in your TV that would take your 3D Blu-ray signal and convert it uh, to multi-view. And here we use practically the same algorithms for image domain warping that you've seen before. No, but now we are generating a multitude of uh, virtual views. Uh, so you have M camera views as input. And now it goes to, to a couple of uh, yeah, practically the same processing steps. We first do an image analysis, and we calculate warps, and then we do the, the view synthesis to generate the N output views. And this is also, I think, nicely that illustrates the, the image extraction. So here are the, the sparse disparities that I have. 
Uh, and you see how, how those are estimated. Here's an example of the corresponding image saliency. And this is what you do when you enforce disparity. So your phi function tells you, you know, if you put a camera into the middle, you want to divide all these disparities by two. And then enforcing these disparities will move them to a certain virtual space. And now if you have this grid, the whole image content will move with these sparse disparities and generate your virtual views on your desired viewing position. And here are a few examples again. So that's a virtual camera move from the left to the right, and all the images in between are uh, synthesized. No? So I think it works very well, and it works automatically and reliably in contrast to, to depth estimation. And another thing that you can do, to some extent, you can also, if these are the the original views you can interpolate, but you can also, to some extent, go beyond to extrapolate views. And that's something, because the autostereoscopic displays, they need more total disparity than you have in your stereo, so you want to extrapolate, which is not that well possible if you don't have good depth maps, as they would create holes. So we, we also participated in this MPEG test for, uh, for this new standard, where people brought their technology for video plus depth or video plus other data representation and coding and did viewing conditions so that's three four different bit rates and these are the different proposals and you see this one was ours together with uh, Fraunhofer HHI uh, and we performed among the four bests in these tests, although ours was completely automatic, working only on the video, whereas the others used these hand-tuned depth maps that they had. So this is a proof that this approach of image domain warping can do the same uh, quality while still being, while even be automatic. Uh, so that's the current setting where we only transmitted the views and did the whole uh, processing at the receiver. And we are actually working with uh, uh, with uh, some students also on a hardware implementation of that. So there will be a chip that does this image domain warping, taking two views as input and generating the nine views by uh, image domain warping. Uh, so that's uh, this type of scenario if you do everything at the receiver. But you can also think of taking parts of that out. No? So to get this data to the sender and then send Warp like DIBRs would work, like sending depth maps, but the difference is that this thing here would work automatically. No? So we, if you look at these warps, now you see also these are uh, data that is pretty much uh, very well representable and encodable. So we did tests like um, encoding video sequences of this MPEG test set for 3D video and encoding the warps. And you see that at a very limited overhead that you have to add to the, to the video data, you get this functionality of auto stereo and depth adaptation via uh, uh, image domain warping. Uh, and so that's why this is now also considered for, uh, for an extension of the H264 or the HEVC codec to send an SEI message that would signal the transport of such uh, warp data. And that's... Uh, it now, I would say. So if we summarize, content creation and stereo 3D is understood to some extent. That counts for the creative part as well as uh, for the technology. It's really mature, but it still leaves room for research in depth estimation and uh, many other things as well. Now you saw that there are a lot of battlegrounds still going on along the processing chain. Um, it has to have some kind of understanding of the scene, so everything I showed had was some kind of disparity-aware algorithms, uh, tools, um, and workflows. Um, yeah, there's publications around that, what I told you, and also material online, videos online, if you want to, to look at things. There's a whole special issue about 3D media and displays that, was, uh, that appeared recently. Um, Credits also, much of the DIBR material was from my f uh, prior uh, engagement with Fraunhofer HHI and examples from other research institutes. And that brings me to the end of my talks, and I thank you very much.
I see. Okay. Uh, Mika Rautinen from the University of Oulu. Uh, I became interested that uh, lots of these techniques have been developing for the content production side of you. But what's happening at, in, at the consumer level is that, uh, especially in, in the recent like five years, there hasn't been too much adoption of uh, uh, home consumers for 3D content. I don't know whether that's uh, uh, displays or what. Uh, so my question is, uh, you probably have studied the te technologies at home and how they have been adopted for 3D use. And uh, can you give some perspectives? Uh, perspective, uh, what's happening? Uh, what will happen within these few years? In yeah, uh, indeed, there was uh, a hype, uh, 2010, maybe 2009, uh, around 3D. And I think 3D is well established in the cinema. People accept it. There is exciting content. Uh, coming out so uh, if you look uh, if you have a chance and didn't see it yet life of p life of pi is a ex really great movie so i think this is here to stay um, also from our perspective from the studio perspective we were hoping a lot that also this ecosystem for 3d to the home would be more uh, accepted by the users so everyone can buy 3d blu-rays and um, it's also pretty much difficult to buy a tv set that is not 3d anymore but we realized that this, uh, it was maybe too much uh, hope in that and that the user acceptance of 3D at home is not that big. No? So the people, there are some freaks, some people who like it, they buy the 3D Blu-rays and they watch movies, but it's not the wide uh, audience that would uh, watch it. And also the 3D TV channels uh, are more in an experimental stage, so that's not really uh, showing off uh, a lot of gain and uh, uh, one reason for that might also be that wearing glasses in a home environment sitting with your family on on the couch is not really something you you accept so that's why pe some people hope that auto stereo uh, will will maybe be the n next big thing to come I'm skeptical about that as these auto stereoscopic displays are still far away from providing you the picture quality and depth quality that uh, you would expect. So I'm in general not that personally not that optimistic that 3D in the home will be such a big uh, run over the next years. But still other applications like cinema are uh, certainly there to stay and also gaming and others other things might be um, might be of success. And also 3D will not replace 2D. It will be something where you have this movie, th which is Life of Pi, and you want to see it at home also in 3D. So at that point, you may decide to, to take the 3D glasses and watch a movie, but it will not be something that is uh, replacing the 2D viewing experience. Thank you very much. Next Luckily, it's a short question. Uh, Hi, uh, I'm uh, Dick Balterman from CWI in Amsterdam. Um, my question is how much of this is used in a production environment? You said that uh, a lot of your transformations can happen automatically, but are they reliable enough that um, the content side of your company will, uh, will actually use them in, in deployment? Are they still in the research phase? We are in the Res uh, in the tech transferring phase, if you want, and uh, they are at least as reliable and as good as all the alternatives that are based on depth estimation. So they are an additional tool in their toolbox for doing the things that they, they have to do anyway. Yeah. Okay, but if in a production environment now, do they typically do hand hand retouching of these? Yes. Or okay, yeah. and and do they also do that with you? with your techniques? For example, the, the back of someone who you only uh, have only captured from the front, how do you do back clothing estimation and, and back content estimation? Yeah, so it certainly has limits. And it's, as I said, it's another tool that uh, widens the opportunities, but that doesn't solve all the problems that they have. Okay. Hello, my name is Mejdit Temesh from the European Patent Office. Uh, this question regarding your proposal in the MPEG. This mic is only for the recording. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
regarding your question about the proposal, your proposal in the um, uh, in the MPEG, uh, of the image warps, uh, are we seeing here a similar trend to what happened with 2D motion? That is uh, basically a draw that is PSNR a uh, little bit motivating the proposals, meaning image warps instead of depth. I don't, the relation to, to PSNR, I don't get that yet. Okay, meaning that uh, basically dropping from real depth, uh, coding real depth uh, to coding w image, what you, what you define as image warps, are we somehow uh, um, basically motivated by um, better PSNR gains? Uh, no, the... I don't think that you can do any PSNR evaluations if it comes about image domain war and uh, about view synthesis. It's difficult to do um, PSNR evaluations. So most of these evaluations are based on subjective impressions. And also mm -hmm. these tests were made uh, uh, doing subjective viewing. But and the in the that sense, so the argument is that uh, for DIBR you need depth maps and it's yeah, difficult to get them to say at least. And this is an alternative that gives you the same subjective visual quality, that's what how it was measured, which allows it to do it automatically. Okay. Thank this you. Yeah. Any further questions? Yes. Okay. Uh, Roger Zimmerman from National University of Singapore. Um, especially for movies, I mean, okay, especially for movies, usually the directors are very uh, particular in, uh, you know, having artistic controls. Um, do you see any, um, I don't know, any sort of conflicts here that, that the directors want things in a certain way and then there are the automatic, uh, automatic al algorithms that alter things in a certain way? Yeah, so th that's actually a, a very big uh, problem that we have to fight uh, all the time. So not that much we, as we are providing tools, we are the researchers and the people in production finally use them. But directors are indeed very particular about uh, the right of approval of their product. But it goes to some point where it is, for instance, the master. Uh, so certainly they approve the master that goes to the cinemas and uh, they also have the right to approve the master that goes on the Blu-rays or distributed out there. Not all directors do that, but some really look at that and are very particular, as you say, about that. But beyond that, it's out of their reach. No? So as in the moment where you have it on the Blu-ray, the television does what it does. And uh, so then they are certainly I would hope at least be thankful if it does something better than uh, something else. And because anyway, that's w when the TV does, does the things. And, and it's the same in 2D. In the moment where it gets out, your TV does all the, all the things. So you have the color, you have the brightness, you have the cutting. It does all sorts of things that, and it will not look the same as it look in, in the cinema. Thank you all. Thanks. Thanks.